Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 73. Dearest, said the little princess after breakfast on the morning of the 19th of March, and her downy little lip rose from old habit, but as sorrow was manifest in every smile, the sound of every word, and even every footstep in that house since the terrible news had come. So now the smile of the little princess, influenced by the general mood, though without knowledge of its cause, was such as to remind one still more of the general sorrow. Dearest, I'm afraid this morning's frustic, as Foka the cook calls it, has disagreed with me. What is the matter with you, my darling? You look pale. Oh, you are very pale, said Princess Mary in alarm, running with her soft, ponderous steps up to her sister-in-law. Your Excellency, should not Mary Bogdavana be sent for, said one of the maids who was present. Mary Bogdavona was a midwife from the neighboring town who had been at Bald Hills for the last fortnight. Oh, yes, assented Princess Mary. Perhaps that's it. I'll go. Courage, my angel. She kissed Liza and was about to leave the room. Oh, no, no. And besides the pallor and the physical suffering on the little princess's face, an expression of childish fear of an inevitable pain showed itself. No, it's only indigestion. Say it's only indigestion. Say so, Mary. Say. The little princess began to cry capriciously like a suffering child and to wring her little hands, even with some affectation. Princess Mary ran out of the room to fetch Mary Bogdanova. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, oh, she heard as she left the room. The midwife was already on her way to meet her, rubbing her small, plump white hands with an air of calm importance. Mary Bogdanova, I think it's beginning, said Princess Mary, looking at the midwife with wide-open eyes of alarm. Well, the Lord be thanked, Princess, said Mary Bogdanova, not hastening her steps. You young lady should not know anything about it. But how is it the doctor from Moscow is not here yet, said the Princess. In accordance with Liza and Prince Andrew's wishes, they had sent in good time to Moscow for a doctor and were expecting him at any moment. No matter, Princess, don't be alarmed said Mary Bogdanova. We'll manage very well without a doctor. Five minutes later, Princess Mary from her room heard something heavy being carried by. She looked out. The men servants were carrying the large leather sofa from Prince Andrew's study into the bedroom. On their faces was a quiet and solemn look. Princess Mary sat alone in her room listening to the sounds in her house, now and then opening her door when someone passed and watching what was going on in the passage. Some women, passing with quiet steps in and out of the bedroom, glanced at the princess and turned away. She did not venture to ask any questions, and shut the door again, now sitting down in her easy chair, now taking her prayer book, now kneeling before the icon stand. To her surprise and distress, she found that her prayers did not calm her excitement. Suddenly, her door opened softly, and her old nurse, who hardly ever came into that room as the old prince had forbidden it, appeared on the threshold with a shawl around her head. I've come to sit with you a bit, Masha, said the nurse. And here I've brought the prince's wedding candles to light before his saint, my angel, she said with a sigh. Oh, nurse, I'm so glad. God is merciful, Bertie. The nurse lit the gilt candles before the icons and sat down by the door with her knitting. Princess Mary took a book and began reading. Only when footsteps or voices were heard did they look at one another. The princess anxious and inquiring, the nurse encouraging. Everyone in the house was dominated by the same feeling that Princess Mary experienced as she sat in her room. 
But owing to the superstition that the fewer the people who know of it, the less a woman in travail suffers, everyone tried to pretend not to know. No one spoke of it, but apart from the ordinary, staid, and respectful good manners habitual in the princess's household, a common anxiety, a softening of the heart, and a consciousness that something great and mysterious was being accomplished at that moment made itself felt. There was no laughter in the maid's large hall. In the men's servants' hall, all sat waiting, silent, and alert. In the outlying serfs' quarters, torches and candles were burning, and no one slept. The old prince, stepping on his heels, paced up and down his study, and sent to Khan to ask Mary Bogdanova what news. Say only that the prince told me to ask, and come and tell me her answer. Inform the prince that labor has begun, said Mary Bogdanova, giving the messenger a significant look. Tikhon went and told the prince. Very good, said the prince, closing the door behind him, and Tikhon did not hear the slightest sound from the study after that. After a while he re-entered it, as if to snuff the candles, and seeing the prince was lying on the sofa, looked at him, noticed his perturbed face, shook his head, and going up to him, silently kissed him on the shoulder, and left the room without snuffing the candles, or saying why he had entered. The most solemn mystery in the world continued its course. Evening passed, night came, and the feeling of suspense and softening of heart in the presence of the unfathomable did not lessen, but increased. No one slept. It was one of those March nights when winter seems to wish to resume its sway, and scatters its last snows and storms with desperate fury. A relay of horses had been sent up the high road to meet the German doctor from Moscow, who was expected every moment, and men on horseback with lanterns were sent to the crossroads to guide him over the country road with its hollows and snow-covered pools of water. Princess Mary had long since put aside her book. She sat silent, her luminous eyes fixed on her nurse's wrinkled face, every line of which she knew so well on the lock of grey hair that escaped from under the kerchief, and the loose skin that hung under her chin. Nurse Savishna, knitting in hand, was telling in low tones, scarcely hearing or understanding her own words, what she had told hundreds of times before, how the late princess had given birth to Princess Mary in Kishnev, with only a Moldovian peasant woman to help instead of a midwife. God is merciful. Doctors are never needed, she said. Suddenly, a gust of wind beat violently against the casement of the window, from which the double frame had been removed, by order of the prince. One window frame was removed in each room as soon as the larks returned, <laughs> and forcing open a loosely closed latch, set the damask curtain flapping, and blew out the candle with its chill, snowy draft. Princess Mary shuddered. Her nurse, putting down the stocking she was knitting, went to the window, and leaning out, tried to catch the open casement. The cold wind flapped the ends of the kerchief, and her loose locks of gray hair. "'Princess, my dear, there's someone driving up the avenue,' she said, holding the casement and not closing it. "'With lanterns, most likely the doctor.' "'Oh, my God, thank God,' said Princess Mary. "'I must go and meet him. He does not know any Russian.' Princess Mary threw a shawl over her head and ran to meet the newcomer. As she was crossing the anteroom, she saw through the window a carriage with lanterns standing at the entrance. She went out on the stairs, on a banister post stood a tallow candle, which guttered in the draft. On the landing below, Philip, the footman, stood looking scared and holding another candle. Still lower, beyond the turn of the staircase, one could hear the footstep of someone in thick felt boots, and a voice that seemed familiar to Princess Mary was saying something. "'Thank God,' said the voice. "'And father?' "'Gone to bed,' replied the voice of Damien, the house steward, who was downstairs." Then the voice said something more. Damien replied, and the steps in the felt boots approached the unseen bend of the staircase more rapidly. It's Andrew, thought Prince Mary. No, it can't be. That would be too extraordinary. And at the very moment she thought this, the face and figure of Prince Andrew, in a fur cloak the deep collar of which covered with snow, appeared on the landing where the footman stood with the candle. Yes, it was he, pale, thin, with a changed and strangely softened but agitated expression on his face. He came up the stairs and embraced his sister. You did not get my letter, he asked, and not waiting for a reply, which he would not have received, for the princess was unable to speak. He turned back, rapidly mounted the stairs again with the doctor who had entered the hall after him, they had met at last at the post station, and again embraced his sister. 
What a strange fate, Masha darling. And having taken off his cloak and felt boots, he went to the little princess's apartment. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 73. All right, Prince Andrew's back, baby. And we'll go to uh, the reflection on this chapter. A Year of War and Peace, Day 73. Habits and Homecomings. David Hume, reflecting on what most promotes human happiness, wrote that habit is a powerful means of reforming the mind and implanting in it good dispositions and inclinations. In other words, according to Hume, the mental dispositions necessary for a life of happiness are best supported by extended and dedicated habitual practice of such dispositions. We can see this in today's chapter and by looking closely at what habits Princess Mary and her father practice and how these practices are related to their personalities. Princess Mary, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, makes a habitual practice of prayer. We're told in this chapter that she prays in an attempt to calm her nerves because of the excitement of Princess Liza going into labor. I'm assuming Princess Mary practices Eastern Orthodoxy, so her prayers probably revolve around the Orthodox Christian virtues of faith, hope, knowledge, wisdom, honesty, humility, obedience, patience, courage, faithfulness, temperance, generosity, gratitude, and love. If you've read War and Peace before, or if you're reading along this year, you'll certainly see that these virtues are pretty much descriptions of Princess Mary's character. In just this chapter alone, she's shown her generosity and love by caring for Princess Liza and tending to the things in the household that need attending to. Old Prince Bolkowski is a different sort altogether. His habits are more secular and more severe. We've seen this in previous chapters. In today's chapter, we learn that he's also in the habit of removing one winter window frame from each room as soon as the larks have returned to Bald Hills. It appears the larks have returned to Bald Hills, so one of the winter window frames has been removed. The only problem, of course, is that on this particular night, in addition to Princess Liza going into labor, it was one of those nights when winter seems to wish to resume its sway and scatters its last snows and storms with desperate fury. So we see that the habits of Mary yield a warm, loving personality, while the habits of her father yield a rather rigid and stern disposition. Oh, and Princess Andrew returns today. He's not dead. Yay. Daily Meditation Every habit and faculty is maintained and increased by the corresponding actions. The habit of walking by walking. The habit of running by running. If you would be a good reader, read. If a writer, write. But when you shall not have read for thirty days in succession, but have done something else, you will not know the consequence. In the same way, if you shall have lain ten days, get up and attempt to make a long walk, and you will see how your legs are weakened. Generally, then, if you would make anything a habit, do it. If you would not make it a habit, do not do it, but accustom yourself to doing something else in place of it. So it is with respect to the affections of the soul. When you have been angry, you must know that not only has this evil befallen you, but you have also increased the habit, and in a manner thrown fuel upon fire. When you have been overcome in sexual intercourse with a person, do not reckon this single defeat only, but reckon that you have also nurtured, increased your incontinence. For it is impossible for habits and faculties, some of them not to be produced, when they did not exist before, and others not be increased and strengthened by corresponding acts. Epictetus, The Discourses all right, cool. So that's my reading and reflection on chapter 73 of War and Peace. I hope you liked it. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are below. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow we will be reading and reflecting on chapter 74 of War and Peace. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and of others.